Hi, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for joining in. Wow, oh, we're going to have a great, great session today. I can feel it. We're going to kind of blow the, blow the lid off of, of uh, any kind of limiting thoughts and beliefs. And so you can feel the joy. And I'm feeling so much joy. I'm so lit up and so happy to be here with all of you and see all your smiling faces. I just, I just love the Zoom format because I can see all your smiling faces. And, and of course we get our list of all the participants. And so, um, yeah, I just wanted again to take a moment to welcome uh, some of the, the new participants that are joining because there's a lot of names I recognize that are like regulars here. And then I just wanted to welcome Ashley, uh, from the United States. Jennifer Norton, I, I remember you from meeting you in North Carolina. I think you're probably still there. I saw you had written in a beautiful uh, prayer. And uh, Lisa Wood, Jonathan, Nicole, uh, I think there's a few more here too. Monica from Norway, Sean from Sweden, Jillian from the UK, Oh, Katie Daly, I remember you from my visits down to Georgia. I look at these uh, participants, uh, Jesus there up in Monterey, Calico's right down here, and I he he, Luce is over there in the Netherlands. I can just see so many people. Peter Smith over there, the UK, AC in Utah, Solveig, Denmark. I mean, it just. Stephanie from Finland, you know, we're walking this together and we are so joined in mind and it's such a deep journey and I feel like we are, it's part of that supportive, nurturing family, family of the mind as you go through the dismantling of the ego perception. And so today with quantum love as our theme, and I did get to watch last night so I got to see everybody pouring their hearts out and some of the, the issues coming up around uh, Jesus and um, I really liked uh, what you were saying, Barbara, the, the resistances with these past ideas of church and, and you know, theology and, and uh, Kristen, yeah, so beautiful when you were sharing that uh, you could really relate, it's like the Christ energy and because it's more abstract, and I think everyone can relate more to this sense of the presence of Christ as opposed to a, a historical figure, a man that seemed to live on the timeline 2,000 years ago. And I loved how you said that, Kristen, that you know, when, you, when you really just open up to Christ's energy, you feel all this love and warmth opening up, and then when you start to think of Jesus, there's these other uh, experiences that come in that can be more of, uh, there are just issues uh, and emotions that arise and of course that's going to be the case with uh, with Jesus because anything and anyone on the timeline uh, of, of duality of time and space is, is, is going to be a projection of separation. So we need to come to know the Christ presence that is who we are, the I am presence that is with us always. And so it was beautiful though to hear all of your uh, sharings about your experiences of, of work opening to quantum love and working with the Course in Miracles. So to talk, to open up today, I thought I would start to bring in a little bit of the the quantum part of quantum love. In other words, um, let's realize that as we're awakening to the truth, we're awakening to the oneness of, of eternal love, that there are different symbols that will be used on the approach to that truth. And um, some of those symbols can seem to have a spiritual or a religious connotation, certainly Jesus and uh, Buddha and Ramana Maharshi and so forth uh, have a, are symbols that have a very much of a spiritual or a religious connotation to them. But also uh, 
some of you maybe are fascinated by uh, the field of philosophy. And of course, you can reach God in many, many different ways because there are many pathways to God. There's just one gateway, you might say, that the pathways all lead to, and the gateway is forgiveness. So whatever it seems to be, whatever symbols you resonate, whatever person, place, thing, whatever symbols you resonate with, great. I, I am so all-encompassing with these symbols. I, I love all the symbols, the religious symbols, the spiritual symbols, the philosophical symbols. Uh, you know, some of you have heard me talk before about the philosopher from Germany, Immanuel Kant, and how he asked the question, how do we know what we know? Oh, that one, that stirs my heart when you have a philosopher asking a question like, how do we know what we know? And he believed, he, he pondered that there was a, a, a way of knowing prior to the earth, prior to the five senses, a priori, prior to the senses that was, uh, that was, we could call it uh, the I am presence or spirit. Uh, it was prior to any experiences or memories of time and space. And so that's a pathway to God. If you really follow the philosophers and you get down that deep to ask that question, how do we know what we know, you're actually in a beautiful place to start to open up towards quantum, quantum field, quantum physics. In science, uh, the quantum realm and the quantum field is synonymous with the happy dream or the forgiven world. It's, the, it's what the scientists, the quantum physicists discovered. It basically is this unified field of, of energy and, and it's completely connected. There is nothing in the field that is disconnected. So the quantum physicists are calling it the quantum field. I love that terminology. Uh, some of you maybe are not into science so much, or you're not into religion, and you're not into spirituality, but you love poetry. Do I have any poetry lovers there? Anybody like poetry? Anybody to take a poetry pathway to God? That's a fun one too. That's another way to go to God. What about Rumi? Anybody ever heard of Rumi? You know? He said, there is a field, I will meet you there. Oh boy, I'm having fun talking about the quantum field today because Rumi and I are talking about the same field, that I'll meet you there in the field. And so that's another pathway to God. Philosophy, poetry, all kinds of great literature. Any Shakespeare fans? You know, any Shakespeare fans? Wow, Shakespeare was a beautiful being too. He, he launched us toward, toward our truth of our spiritual being. You know, all the world's a stage and everyone must play their part. You know, we've been watching people play their parts and we've been watching this dream and all of these parts being played out, all of these stories, all of these roles. Shakespeare knew that, but there's something transcendent that Shakespeare was pointing to something beyond the foolishness of the world. And so we're going to talk today about quantum love. In our community, um, my friend Kirsten one time, she was driving down from uh, towards, towards Salt Lake City and um, as I recall, she had to, she started receiving the lyrics to this song called Quantum Love. And the lyrics just started coming and coming and coming to her. And I think she, she finally like had to uh, pull the car over and start to type out some of these lyrics so she didn't forget the song. But that song uh, titled Quantum Love has almost become like a theme in our community. So, so if you haven't had a chance to uh, hear the version of Quantum Love, well, there's been different versions sung, but um, Eric, who's, who's working on the, the keyboard today on the chat room, maybe you can post a version of Quantum Love out for everybody to listen to uh, this afternoon before the movie starts. But Quantum Love, uh, 
There's one part in the song where the song goes, um, It's quantum physics, baby. Love radiates undefined. So there's just a little bit of this of the song for you. It's quantum physics, baby. This is how Jesus sings to us. It's quantum physics, baby. Love radiates undefined. Now that last word, undefined, is pretty important because everything in this world has what? A definition. I mean, even when I travel around the world, I've been in 44 countries and I meet atheists, agnostics, I meet people who, are, who say they're believers, or they say they're, 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 they don't believe in God, or sometimes I'll meet somebody and I'm sitting at a, at a restaurant or a, a laundromat or in a park or whatever, and we'll start talking and then uh, if the God word comes out, then sometimes people will say to me, define God. And I always burst into laughter when people ask me to define God, because most of us know God is love, and love doesn't have a definition. It's not a concept. It's, it's a reality. It's, it's not something you can define. You know, when, sometimes when people ask me to define God, I just burst into laughter because I, I think they want me to give some kind of definition to God or some kind of of conceptual understanding to God, and I would say all definitions and all concepts veil and cover over the experience of God's love. So that's why Buddha said, empty your mind. That's why Jesus said, empty your mind. That's why Ramana Maharshi said, empty your mind. That's why Muji says, empty your mind. That's why I say, empty your mind. Why do we keep saying, empty your mind, except that it's just concepts? and definitions that block you from knowing who you are. And the quantum realm, the quantum field, is a state that is beyond definition as well. That's why it's the gateway back to God. Why is the forgiven world the gateway to God? Why is the happy dream the gateway to God? Why, why is this beautiful field that Rumi talked about and that the quantum physicists talk about, why is this the gateway back to God. It's because there's no judgment in this field. It's totally unified. There's not anything that exists apart from anything else. Uh, recently on one of the retreats I was talking about Einstein. There's another great uh, witness of, of an open mind that was really passionate about uh, knowing, wanting to know. And a lot of Einstein's uh, insights were so far ahead of his time, so to speak, that, that there are still things that Einstein came, became aware of that, that fit beautifully with quantum physics. Uh, decades later, after Einstein passed away, they fit beautifully with it because Einstein was so open and so curious. He had a mind like a curious mind, like a child. He, he loved living in the wonder. He loved getting to that place where he had to open his heart and have faith and trust in all, even his theories, you know, he would postulate things, but in the end, he was like the Beatles, opening to all you need is love. He was opening wide to experience this love. So when we talk about quantum, a lot of times, uh, I think people, I think Stephanie, you wrote in, and different ones, people write to me and they go, I don't really know what quantum means. I, I don't have a clue, but when you talk about it, I get all warm and fuzzy inside. Even though I don't know what it means, it, it's something, it sounds really good every time you mention that word, quantum, uh, because quantum is so expansive. All that quantum really is, is, is the understanding that, that there is no world apart from your mind. There is no world apart from consciousness. That's why for most, even quantum physicists, they tend to use the word mysterious, because to them the quantum field is, is a huge mystery. Like, they wouldn't begin to try to give a full 
uh, explanation of it. They can give all the, the discoveries that they've found in their experiments that point to it, but the field itself is so mysterious. Uh, it reminds me of this movie that was made, I think Ben Affleck was in this movie, it was called To the Wonder, and the wonder is the miracle, and all of us are just opening up to the wonder. We just want to come back into the wonder where our eyes get real big and we feel filled up with love and joy for no earthly reason. We just feel like, wow, what an amazing life. What an amazing life. What, what an amazing gift that it is to feel alive, to feel fulfilled, to feel joy and happiness. Now, Einstein himself, you know, when he started to discover things like, like particles that seem to be huge distances apart. If you, if you did thing, something to one particle, it would affect another particle a, far, far apart in time and space. And, and this for him was, was like a, a spooky occurrence from a distance. This was, this was real spooky to Einstein that things would be that connected and be that seemingly afar in time and space. And so even for Einstein, when he started to tap into the field, to the quantum field, Einstein used the word spooky because to a scientist, everything being connected is spooky. That is woo-woo. <laughs> That's what scientists would call woo-woo. Everything being connected, everything being somehow joined and one. Whoa, you know, why is that so spooky? It's because, because Newtonian physics, which is the physics that all of us were raised with, is, is the study of, of separation. It's the study of separate things, separate, separate realms, separate images. You know, some of you might have seen the movie uh, What the Bleep Do We Know? And there's the, the physicist in there where he takes a picture and he shows the picture in the movie and he says, the, the strange thing is though, is because you can see these, there's two different aspects on the picture. And then he says, the funny thing is, they know for sure that the, both of these things are actually the same. He, he describes it in the movie, he says, it's two different things. No, it's two different objects, but actually they're the same thing. And he says, I know it looks like two, but believe me, they're one. They have now photographed things that are actually in different places, but they're the same thing. Now, for most of us watching, you know, we watch the movie, we go, that's ridiculous. Clearly, that's two things. That's not one thing. He's saying it's one thing, but it's clearly two things because you can't have two things that are in separate time and space that are the same thing. You know, our, our Newtonian uh, ego-based mind says, no, no, they are not the same. They are clearly different. On the photograph, they are clearly different. Well, if you start to study quantum physics, you will start to realize that, that actually Max Planck and some of the, the, the ones who, who were studying atoms and, and subatomic particles and so forth, they were all coming from the mindset that, that the world, the universe, is built on separate things. Everything is separate and unique. It has, it's building blocks. So even for those who discovered the atom, they were discovering something and they were going, great, we're finally finding some of the tiniest parts of what matter is, what the material u universe is. And then they got into the protons and then the electrons. And, and then, as you get more quantum, you start to realize that atoms aren't things. The original discoverers really started to discover that atoms aren't really things, that this cosmos is not built on things, even tiny, tiny things. Subatomic particles is not the tiniest little particles in the building blocks of what seems to be a giant material universe. But atoms are are potentials. They're simply potentials. Uh, Subatomic particles are simply potentials. And everything that's perceived through the five senses is, is simply a world of potentiality. 
Well, I could call that hypothetical. This whole projected world of time and space is is, an, is a hypothetical. Why is it a hypothetical? Because it's all based on one belief, as if the separation happened. Okay, that's a big one. <laughs> as if separation was possible, and then a whole picture, a motion picture of time and space reflecting this one false assumption that time and space are actually possible, that separation is actually possible. Separation from the Creator, from God, is, is possible. That's the assumption underneath this fragmented cosmos. Now, I'm going to use a, one, um, one experiment, one famous experiment from, uh, I, I say it's part of the foundations of quantum physics, you know. I mean, they talk about Schrodinger's cat, that's a very famous experiment. Um, people have told me and asked me questions for years like, you know, if a tree falls in the forest, and there's no one there to hear it, does it make a sound? You know, those are the kind of philosophical conundrums. And what I'm saying is, everything originates in the mind. So all sounds or originate in the mind, all actions, everything that seems to occur in time and space is still in the mind, and it hasn't left the source. Even though it's a projection, and it seems as if it's external, and it seems as if it's an objective world out there, what quantum physics has shown us is that there is no objective world apart from consciousness. This is what Jesus is teaching us through A Course in Miracles. Actually, this is what all the sages and saints throughout history have been teaching us. There is no world apart from what you think. It's the thinking, it's the ego thinking that's the problem. There's nothing going wrong in the world. There's nothing going right in the world. It's a, it's a veil. It's a smokescreen. It's a mirage. It's this uh, labyrinth that seems to have a reality, but it's, it's fragmented. It's broken into all these different pieces, and that gives it away that it doesn't have anything to do with the field, and it doesn't have anything to do with reality. Fragmentation, separation is not part of reality. And what is this cosmos except a, a cosmos of things? Whether you talk about black holes or galaxies or sun, stars, planets, trees, mountains, people, kitty cats, caterpillars, uh, everything you can imagine in time and space is a projection of the belief in separation. So the veil is is the veil, of, it's a trick. Jesus tells us in the Course, time is a trick, a sleight of hand in which figures come and go. Okay, we're, we're watching a dream, figures do seem to come and go, but the emotions we experience are coming from our consciousness. They're coming from our thoughts. They're coming from our beliefs. They're coming from our faulty perceptions, and this world is nothing but a faulty formulation of reality. It's a faulty perception that has taken the place of, of God, that has taken the place in awareness, not in reality, but in awareness it's just taken, substituted for God's love, for eternal love. Now some of you said, well you mentioned, okay, religion, you mentioned science, now quantum physics, you mentioned poetry, you mentioned spirituality, you know, all these different things. All of these things are just opportunities to come back to that oneness. Now, sometimes I hear people talk about, uh, you know, you can just dismiss logic because Logic won't get you home. You have to follow your heart. Well, let me tell you, in, if you go right into your heart, you're going to find that there's even logic in your divine heart. In the heart of, of God, there is a divine logic. So let me give you, a, lay on you a little bit of divine logic this morning, okay? Because sometimes logic gets a bad name. People associate logic with the ego, and I'm telling you, the spirit uses logic just as much as the ego, so you just need to open your mind to a little divine logic. Okay, here we go. Spirit is in a state of grace forever. 
Your reality is only spirit. Therefore, you are in a state of grace forever. Now that's an example of divine logic. I'll say it again. A, B, C. Spirit is in a state of grace forever. Your reality is only spirit. Therefore, you are in a state of grace forever. If you can follow that divine logic, you can also realize why this, the, the introduction to the Course says, nothing real can be threatened. Ha ha, spirit. Nothing unreal exists. Ha ha, time and space. Herein lies the peace of God. Grace is simply the experience of spirit. And I might add that your mind, Jesus says in the Course, in the clarification of terms, the mind is the activating agent of spirit. So anytime anybody just says, forget about your mind, I would not toss out the activating agent of spirit so fast if I was you, because your mind's capable of some divine logic. And actually that's part of the wake-up. It's just that if you use logic with a false premise, all, logic always depends on the first premise. So if your first premise is separation, if your first premise is fragmentation, if your first premise is the belief that you can leave source, then that's a faulty premise. And you should not even be surprised that the projected world that you're looking upon seems to be reflecting that false premise. You know, what did Jesus say in the Course? Into eternity, where all is one, there crept the tiny mad idea at which the Son of God remembered not to laugh. Don't you want to be the one who laughs? Don't you be the one who, who actually laughs at the ego and realizes it can have no heavy consequences because it doesn't have a source? You know, sometimes I was growing up and people would say, oh, so-and-so, they're, they're a bastard child. I said, what's a bastard child, you know? And they say, well, that's a child that wasn't born in wedlock. Well, wedlock? Isn't wedlock union? Yeah. So you're talking, you're telling me there's such a thing as a bastard child that wasn't born in wedlock, that wasn't born in union? Well, that to me sounds like the ego. God, why would God create fear? Why would God create death? Why would God create disease? Why would love create shame? Why would eternity create time? There is no such thing actually as a bastard child because there can be no child that, that arises apart from union. The child of God, the Christ child, is still in the mind of God, still in the heart of God. That's why Christ is so beautifully innocent. I heard you sharing that, Kristen from California, and I heard you sharing that last night, that you feel this sense when you think of Jesus, the, the warm feeling you feel as you think of this innocence, this amazing, this staggering innocence. And that's because Christ is innocent, and, and you're Christ and I'm Christ. And we were created as Christ. No wonder it feels so good. It it's, comes from our source. But it doesn't really leave any room for a bastard child. I, that's not part of the, the story of, of God's creations, you know. Maybe we have stories about the fall from grace, but that can't be real. We can't really, truly have fallen from grace. It must be a trick. So I appreciate for you for sharing that. Now let me go back. I said I was going to use a quantum experiment to uh, try to explain this. So some of you have heard of the double slit experiment where the quantum physicists, this, is, this goes back some decades, but where they, they decide, decide they're going to this, this plate of metal and there's two slits and they decide they're going to start to fire subatomic particles. They're going to fire these particles through these two slits. In fact, um, in fact, when they fire them through the one slit, then there's, the particles form a, a, a pattern on the wall. Uh, behind the metal plate. And then when they start with the two slits, they fire these particles through the slits, and then they were shocked by what they found, because 
because something strange started happening when the particles went through both slits and they started to kind of interact with each other and form a pattern that the scientists did not expect to see on the wall. Some of you are familiar with this. Anybody who knows anything of science, it's a famous double slit experiment. What, what happened was they, they fire the particles and then when the particles go through the slit, they seem to interact with each other and, and make a pattern on the wall that actually was a pattern of like two waves interacting. Like if you had ripples of waves in a pool and the way the waves came together, they had a wave pattern on the wall. And they expected a, a particle, vertical particle pattern, and they had a wave pattern appear. And this was very frustrating to the scientists. To the Newtonian scientists, that's like, no, no, they don't like it when they make an experiment and something shows up that's not what they expect. Because they know that something fishy's going on if what they predicted is, is not happening. So after a while they started to realize they couldn't imagine what happens to the particles when they go through that slit. They, they behave differently. They're going they're be like a particle and then all of a sudden they go through a slit and now they're behaving like a wave. Now this was shocking to them. You know, it's like, are you a particle or a wave? Come on, make up your mind. You, you act like a particle and then you start acting like a wave. What's going on? What, what is happening to these particles that they start acting like waves? Well, basically they, they decided they put a tiny little camera right there at the metal plate to watch and observe. And what they found through this whole experiment was just by the camera being there and by the act of observation that was bringing about the, the appearance of, of a wave pattern. Just the act of observing in their experiment changed the outcome of, of what they expected to see. The act of observing. This is no different than Schrodinger's, Schrodinger's cat experiment and so many quantum experiments where they're starting to show the more experience the experiments they ran they started to realize that that the observation from the scientist, from the experimenter was determining the outcome that every outcome that they were experiencing was the result of, of a decision that was made in the experimenter's mind. That, that all the experiments were subjective. They could not continue to believe in an objective science. They could not continue to believe in the scientific method, Newtonian, that they believed in because suddenly they realized that their perception of the experiment was determined by something that was going on in their own consciousness. And this was just the tip of the iceberg because they started to discover that there is no external world. That this belief system, these thoughts that are going on in the mind are determining the world that you perceive. So I've said it many times, I've said the, the perceptual world that you see is a motion picture of your consciousness. It's nothing more than a motion picture of consciousness. And if you don't like anything about this world, and I mean anything at all about this cosmos of time and space, it's because in your mind you're believing it and you're perceiving it because you believe it. And the only way that you can see it as it truly is, or see it without judgment, is to forgive it. That's why Jesus taught forgiveness was the pathway back to God. Now, this, let's go back to that experiment again. Now, imagine, you know, you're not a scientist, and, but it's like, that is strange that you fire particles and then all of a sudden they turn into waves. This is how perception works. In A Course in Miracles, Jesus explains the double split experiment. He doesn't refer to it as the double split experiment, but he does explain it because he says projection makes perception. In other words, what you're perceiving, the wavelengths that you're perceiving in time and space, you're perceiving a, a world of fragmentation and everything that seems to be the projected world is, is all of perception, all of wrong-minded, fragmented, distorted perception comes about from projection. Projection of what? 
projection of the belief that you could separate from God. It's this one tiny little tiny mad idea in the mind. And if you believe in this tiny mad idea of fragmentation, then you perceive a projected world of fragmentation. That's why when Andy was here and Andy was talking about, I've mentioned it many times, that it's a perceptual problem. Quantum physics is just giving you a really good glimpse into this being a perceptual problem. In other words, you have a thought and you see a world of images, but you think that the thoughts going through your mind are not the same as the images that you perceive. But Jesus tells us in the early part of the workbook, my thoughts are images I have made. If I have private thoughts, I will see a private world. If I have thoughts of separation, of attack, if I have grievances, I will see that separation, that attack, those grievances, I will see them acted out in front of my awareness, in the dream, because of this tiny mad idea of separation. Now, let's try to put it in simple terms. Imagine that you don't know anything about science, you don't know anything about the, the double slit experiment or anything about quantum physics. But just say that you were out living on a farm and you have this big farm wall and you decide that you're just going to, you're bored, you don't know what to do, you're going over to your apple tree and you start to pick a bushel of, of apples and then you go over to your cherry tree and you pick a bushel of cherries. And then you still don't know what to do, you start eating them a little bit but you get full. So you're just sitting there and you're looking at this big wall at the edge of your farm and you start to decide you're just going to start to throw cherries over the wall. And so you just start flinging cherries you out of your bushel, you're flinging cherries over the wall, you're flinging your cherries over the wall, you're flinging your cherries over the wall. And then afterwards you go out and you go around and you don't find any cherries over there on the other side of the wall, they're all bananas. You've thrown cherries over the wall. You threw a bunch of cherries over the wall and now there's a bunch of bananas laying over there. Your cherries have turned into bananas just by going over the wall. It's a pretty mysterious wall, right? It's like, because your Newtonian mind would tell you if you throw cherries over that wall and you go to the other side, you're going to find cherries on the ground, not a bunch of bananas all over the place. That's how shocked the scientists were when they fired particles and then on the other side of the slit came these wave patterns. They were like, holy moly. That would be like you on the farm going, I threw cherries and I got bananas. I can't even believe this. Now, that's what happens in your mind when you hold on to attack thoughts and judgments and grievances. When you hold on to private thoughts, those private thoughts become actions, become things in time and space, become people. If, you're, if you have a thought about a person, you might say to yourself, what's different from me thinking about a person than actually seeing that person sitting across from me? Some of you have done that with people who have passed on. You maybe think of them and you say, I wish you were just here again, I wish I could just sit down and we could have a cup of tea. Because you believe that your thoughts are different from the actual person. You don't believe your thoughts are the people. You always, I mean, when you write into me, you say, my husband passed away, my daughter passed away, my son passed away, my aunt passed away. Where did they go? I said, what do you mean, where did they go? Where are they now? I said, what do you mean, where are they now? They're in your mind like they've always been. People are thoughts. Cherries are thoughts. Bananas are thoughts. <laughs> Black holes are thoughts. Quasars are thoughts. Everything is, without exception, is a thought. Nobody ever leaves your mind. You are simply aware of them or you're not aware of them. And some of you know what I'm talking about. When a loved one has passed away, all of a sudden you feel their presence over you. 
stronger than ever, stronger than even when they were alive, they're there. And that's just another example about how the mind works, because these thoughts, we'll say these cherries turn into bananas, these particles turn into waves, because of the trick of the ego. But actually, they aren't outside your mind. And that's why you have to go within, you have to go within and forgive this split of projection to believe that your mind is somehow separate and apart from this giant external world. And the giant external world somehow is doing you wrong. Treat me right. Dun, dun, dun. You know, Pat Benatar, it's like you, you got something in your mind going, treat me right. You, you images, you mom images, dad images, you government images, you cultural images, you have not treated me right. You've been messing with me. And Jesus says to us in the Course, you better say, I have done this thing and it is this I wouldn't do. You can't be free of hurt and pain until you start to realize that you've been projecting these images and that these projections are really in your mind. They aren't out there at all. You don't need the government to fix your mind. You don't need society to fix your mind. You don't even need some external teacher to teach you to fix your mind. You need to realize that the world is not external to your mind. There's a part in A Course in Miracles where Jesus says, you are mind, holy mind, and purely mind. He doesn't say your mind, body, spirit. He tells you, you are divine mind. You have a very powerful mind because God created you. You actually live and move and breathe in the mind of God. That's how much mind you are. You are so divine mind. And, of course, that divine mind in the ultimate sense is just purely spirit. It's just purely light. But while you still believe in the projection, while you still believe you can get rid of things and point the finger, you know, isn't it great when you're going along and you're, you, all of a sudden you start to get upset and you start to get a little miffed and you know, you're irritated and then, then you go with a big huff, I'm so glad I'm not like that. I'm not like that. What do you mean you're not like that? If you're perceiving something disturbing, where do you think it's coming from? <laughs> it's coming from, from the mind. You, you, if you spot it, you got it. If you, if you spot a grievance, if you spot something you don't like about this world of time and space, I would suggest you go inside your mind to find that and pluck the, the offense from your mind. Pluck the offense, pluck the private thought out of your mind. You know, like you have little tweezers and to pluck like an eye tweezer. You need a mind tweezer. A mind tweezer and pluck that little sucker of a thought, uh, whatever that judgment is, you need to pluck that out of your mind. It doesn't belong in your holy mind. So, ultimately, I'm going to try to make this really simple. <laughs> that, that there's a saying in the Course that I really like. And this, it's a song. Please listen to me sing this song. It's a song, and, and the, the saying is, Fear binds the world. Forgiveness sets it free. That's from Jesus in the Course. Fear binds the world. Forgiveness sets it free. So the song is, this is one of the chants I listen to all day, Fear binds the world, forgiveness sets it free. 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 Now, what does that have to do with quantum love? Well, I'll tell you this. If you are holding on to fear in any way, shape, or form in your mind, if there's anything at all that you fear, doesn't matter whether it seems to be a fear in the world or a fear of God's love, any type of fear, that's like that double slit experience where your observer is going to perceive a fearful world. If you have a t the tiniest, tiniest, tiniest scrap of fear in your mind, 
it doesn't matter. You say, well, I have an unconscious. Well, as long as you believe in an unconscious, then that's, that's fear. That, those are hidden fear thoughts. That's what the unconscious is. Those are fear thoughts that have been pushed out of awareness. They're still there. They're still in the mind. Not, not in reality, in, in heaven, but I mean in awareness, if they're still there, you need to forgive. You need to release that fear in order to be set free. Now, let's take that beautiful song, like I like to do this with Row, Row, Row Your Boat, but let's use this song, Fear Binds the World, Forgiveness Sets It Free. Newtonian binds the world, quantum sets it free. Everybody, Newtonian binds the world, quantum sets it free. Newtonian binds the world, quantum sets it free. Newtonian binds the world, Quantum sets it free. Now you know why I ask you to, on one of these recent uh, online retreats, I said, just check out this quantum stuff. Please, have some fun. Check out this quantum stuff. Why? Because it sets your mind free. What do I mean by qu quantum sets you free and Newtonian binds the world? Because Newtonian is the study of things. Do you think you're ever going to escape a world of things by just believing in things? Do you really think things are things? What makes a thing a thing? Or isn't there a definition that makes a thing a thing? What makes a cup a cup? Except your beliefs. Jesus even says in the workbook of A Course in Miracles, you could receive the vision of Christ if you would remove all your ideas about a table, all your ideas about a cup. If you simply empty your mind of everything that you believe about any object, or one object, you could receive salvation, you could receive the quantum field, you could receive the happy dream just from this cup, if you remove all ideas about the cup from the past. Oh, this looks like a pink cup. Oh, it's kind of got an orangey, orangey thing. Let's look, there's bubbles there. Is this a plastic cup? or a glass cup. That makes a difference, right? If I drop the cup, it makes a difference whether it's plastic or glass, and how high I hold it before I drop it. Oh, location, time, space, color, texture. Everything that you perceive about this cup is coming from the past. Do you really think that Jesus in heaven, in God, are thinking about cups? No, cups are projection of what? The ego. Because why? Because they're a separate thing. Right? It's a thing. Let's admit it's a thing. Now, what Jesus is saying is, the problem is not the cup itself, it's that you believe in the cup itself. No thing in the quantum field has any distinguishing characteristics apart from anything else. Some of you know that, I know you've read and heard things about the holographic universe, and let's just take a, the hologram as a symbol to use for a moment. What is the characteristic of a hologram? The characteristic of a hologram is that inside the part that seems to be the hologram, there's the hole inside the part. That's why it's one of the most interesting kind of uh, concepts on, on the planet, because holograms have the hole inside the part. And what Jesus is telling us in A Course in Miracles is that's the way it works for everybody, that everything you perceive has the Holy Spirit in it. Everything that you perceive, whether it's a slug. I saw you, Andreas, last night. I heard about those slugs. Yes, the slugs have the Holy Spirit in them. That cup has the Holy Spirit in them. Not, not, I'm not talking about pantheism. I'm not saying that God indwells in the cup or in the slug. I'm saying that whole, holistic perception is available in all of the parts. That if you see with the Holy Spirit, you see the whole in the part. You know, you see beyond the part. You actually see the whole. That's what I'm feeling like when I heard all the talk about Jesus, when people were saying, oh, 
They still have issues with Jesus and this. Of course, if you see Jesus in terms of linear time, you're going to have issues. Why? Because, because the ego projected linear time. It's part of the, the ego projected it as a false reality, as a substitute identity for the Christ self that, that, that I am, the I amness. So, if you see Jesus on the line, then you're going to have issues. Because the issues aren't really with the man Jesus, it's with the line. You're still perceiving the stories. You're still perceiving time and space as linear. In the quantum field, time and space are not linear, they are simultaneous. They are simultaneous and they are unified. It's just like one field, one pool of divine love and energy. It's the forgiven world. It's, it's, it's a pool of energy. It's, it's the step towards God. When you come to this pool, when you come to this field, you are so close to God. As the Course says, God will take the final step. All your part is, is to come to the field. Then there's something even beyond the field. <laughs> and that's God. I mean, it's, that's why don't, don't even try to define God. Even when you try to define the field, it's, it's bad enough. <laughs> but don't even go beyond that and try to define God. God has no definition. God just is... There's a part in, in the workbook of A Course in Miracles where Jesus says, we say God is, and then we cease to speak. This is Jesus telling us. We say God is, and we cease to speak. God is all oh, awesome. God is total reverence. God is love beyond anything, even beyond the quantum field. God is. It's so glorious, but there's only one way to know that God is, to come into that direct, full experience of God and knowing that you're the Christ in the mind of God, is you've got to go through and into this quantum field. Now, in the quantum field, everything is unified and connected energy. That's why, Kristen, when you were talking last night and you were saying, when I say the Christ energy, I feel a resonance with that because it's very abstract. Yes, the field is very, very abstract. There are no objects in the field. So there's no wonder you have some issues come up when you think of Jesus the man. Of course, that's the problem. That's going Newtonian. <laughs> you know, spirit can't be male or female or masculine and feminine. It's just, it's just so vast that these ideas of male, female, masculine, and feminine are the tiniest little things. They're just concepts. Just more concepts that the ego invented. Do you notice about these how dualistic they are? Male, female, masculine, feminine. You notice how multiplistic uh, and fragmented the ego is. And because everything the ego perceives is about things. And we even turn in religion, we turn God into a thing. You know, how do people tur turn God into a thing? Well, one thing is, is arguing about the name of God, right? Isn't that a good way to, to turn God into a thing? Oh, God's, my God's name is Jehovah. Well, my God's name is Yahweh. Well, mine just calls itself God. Uh, mine is the divine feminine. Uh, mine is the Atman. Uh, mine, you know, it's like, oh, come on. How many names can you give to something that's just one? It's not even one thing. It's not even a thing, so how can you name it? <laughs> you know? Don't worry about taking the Lord's name in vain. All Jesus in the Bible meant by that was stay in alignment with your joy and your happiness and your love. Don't worry about taking the Lord's name in vain because God, and ultimately God is the nameless. You know, you can't name something that has no definition. It's just all that is. It's just pure love. So, if we come back to this, we come back to um, my song again. You know, fragmentation binds the world. Wholeness sets it free. Grievances bind the world. Oneness sets it free. <laughs> Time binds the world, eternity sets it free. Shame binds the world, 
eternal love sets it free. You know, you can use whatever words you want in this song. Because anything that's linear is Newtonian, is about things, and that's not going to take you back to the experience of God's love. If God's love is one, and you're perceiving separate ones, and separate things, and separate problems, you know, problems bind the world, solution sets it free, you know, I have fun with this song. You can, you can put any words you want. Ego binds the world, Holy Spirit sets it free, or if you're like, rather Jesus, as we're on a Jesus theme. Ego binds the world, Jesus sets it free. It doesn't matter. It's holistic perception that frees your mind from the constraints of the, of the ego, of the devil, of evil, of error. Call it whatever you want. Just call it error if you want. Error binds the world. Love sets it free. You know, it's the same thing. You can put any names you want. Now, what I'm telling you right now is the reason we have these online gatherings and the reason I give all these examples is because this is coming to true freedom in your mind. You start to realize that that the problem and the solution are together in the mind, and that the problem has disappeared into the solution. If you can bring it back to your mind, you realize there are, there are no problems. Can you live in the quantum field? Listen, that's, that's the only thing that you should put your attention to every day. If you're putting your attention to the body, if you're putting your attention to trying to fix the, the world, if you're trying to even trying to make the world a better place, if you're trying to change the script, if you're trying to, to dilly-dally and tinker with the screen, and you have not released that filter of ego in your mind, it's going to be pointless to try to change the screen, because you've got to get back off the screen, you've got to come back inside the theater, you've got to come all the way back inside that projector room, You've got to come inside the projector. You've got to come all the way back to that light that's behind the film in order to go quantum. You can't be so identified and dilly-dallying around with the human condition because the human condition is a projection. And you can't actually change the projection until you come back into that light. When you identify with that light inside the projector, you are free. You are essentially free because you are no longer bound by the images of the world. That's why Jesus said, be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. He simply merged with the light. He merged with the light of God. He merged with the Holy Spirit. He merged with that light and therefore he was unaffected by anything of time and space. He was transcendent. Some of you know there's a, a new uh, series on Netflix called Messiah. And uh, it's got 10 episodes. And basically, as you start watching Messiah, you'll start to see that in the middle of a sandstorm, you see this image of this being with this man with long, dark hair who's just so calm, who continues to preach as the massive sandstorm rips through Damascus. You'll see this same figure over in, showing up in a little town in Texas, and then there's a tornado, a twister, they call them, a tornado that comes, and it's got this funnel cloud, a funnel comes down, and it's just ripping to pieces in Kansas, very much like uh, the Wizard of Oz. It's just ripping this little town to pieces, and yet in the footage on social media, you see this figure, there's that figure with the long hair, right in front of the tornado, unaffected by the tornado. Because why? Because the Messiah is not bound by the laws of the world. You think Jesus Christ is bound by, by wind, by hail, by temperatures, by dust? No, no, no. Christ is the light of the I Am Presence before, this, before time. It's prior to time. 
I noticed on my, my list here, two of participants, I, I was digging through some of the, uh, the participants, and I noticed Chanteo, uh, you're back again visiting with us after the Christmas retreat, Delia and Louise all are from Australia. And let's start to put a little practical application right now, because some of you know that uh, right now the fires are burning, huge fires, huge blazes that are out in the bushfires, they're called. Some of them reaching flames, reaching like 40 feet high. Entire towns seem to be wiped out as these bushfires come through. Even towns that seem to have some some space in between them and the forest because the flying embers and the intense heat. So it's kind of a ring of fire around Australia right now and, and lots is going up in flames. Actually, they've estimated that over a half a billion animals have been burned, destroyed, burned in the fire. There have been human bodies burned, huge amounts acres and acres, hectares and hectares of, of trees, forest. It's, it's unlike anything I think that's ever been seen over there. Now, if you bring it back quantum, if you take it back in the higher perspective, have there ever been burning things on the planet? Actually, if you watch if the past year, if you have watched the thermodynamic view, you will find that there is a lot of burning going on on the planet in 2019 and, and on into 2020. Africa, you can find it in Canada, you can find it through the United States. We put on a, a retreat called Strawberry at one time, and the fires came all the way up to the canyon, and the firefighters were just able to stop it at the edge of the canyon where the Living Miracles Monastery is. Now, there are people right now, as we are having this quantum love retreat, there are people calling on prayers all over the world. They're saying, please put Australia and the bushfires in your prayers. Everybody, pr please pray. Science has demonstrated that, that, that meditation and prayer can affect the screen. And Ultimately, the, the prayer is for, ultimately, rain. It, the, they're saying, please pray for rain. Pray for consistent rain to, to come across Australia. Now, this, I just want to use that example to show you how deep this goes. When we see something like fires burning, or we see earthquakes, or we see tsunamis, or we see flooding happening, like the flooding that happens around hurricanes and whatever. When you're perceiving this environment through the human apparatus, through the ego, you are going to see things that are interpreted as disasters and, and interpreted as tragedies. Because why? Because through the body senses, the bodies seem to be being burned. The trees are being burned. Houses are being burned. This is, from the ego perspective, this is a tragedy of, on a huge scale, a tragedy on a, on a vast scale. And yet, what I'm saying to you is, everything is an interpretation. God did not create this world. God did not create countries. Remember the John Lennon song, Imagine, Imagine There's No Country? I wonder if you can. Nothing to kill or die for, a brotherhood of man. That when you have the belief in an, in an identity separate from God, with separate pieces and separate parts, it's the fragmented perception that is the tragedy. It's seeing something that isn't really there. What do I mean by that? If, if heaven is real, and spirit is real, and love is real, and you're perceiving something that's temporary, and you're giving reality to the temporary, that's where you're generating a tragedy. Because you're taking something that is not spirit, and you're putting your attention and focus on it, and you're saying 
something on the screen has gone terribly wrong. It needs help. You're saying the screen needs help. I'm saying the, get back in the projector room because perceiving this world, the mind that's asleep and dreaming this world, that's what needs the help. That's what needs salvation. It's not the bodies. It's not the persons. It's the mind that, that is insistent on dreaming a world of fragmentation that refuses to forgive. And really, the only responsibility you have as a miracle worker, the only responsibility you have to take yourself back to eternity is to forgive the perception of the world. That's why when I say that the only problem is a, is a belief in a fragmented world, that's what I mean by it's a perceptual problem. You're perceiving a faulty formulation of reality that really has nothing to do with reality. I'll go back to the divine logic. Spirit is in a state of grace forever. Your reality is only spirit. Therefore, you are in a state of grace forever. Love creates love creates love. Error makes illusions, begets more illusions. In this world of fragmentation, don't you notice that the images seem to be multiplying? There's more humans. They say the world population is expanding, is exploding. They say with marketing and advertising, they're calling it a, an image explosion now with television, satellite, images exploding. New, you know, the commercials still haven't changed since the 1950s. New and improved. How much new and improved do we need if we have a soul sickness? If we, if we forgot who our creator is, how much new and improved in the world do we need? And not just the burning fires in Australia, but let, let's talk about Nazi Germany. You know, let's talk about concentration camps. Let's talk about famines. Let's talk about pestilence and disease. Let's, let's really transfer the training here to, to come back to that thing of, of, oh my gosh, I have got a perceptual problem and I have been attempting to project it to be something else. The last place I've looked for salvation is inside my own mind. I have looked for salvation in in possessions. I've looked for salvation in interpersonal relationships. I've looked for salvation. Show me where the Savior is. Where's the Messiah? He's over there. He's in Texas. Damn, I should be in Texas. If the, if the Messiah is in Texas, what am I doing here? <laughs> I should be right next to the Messiah in Texas. If the Messiah is in Texas. If he's in the Middle East, where? Syria? Israel? You tell me where. I'll get on a plane. No. We have looked for external messiahs. We have looked for external teachers. We've looked for external saviors. And the last place we've looked is in our own mind. And Jesus himself said, the kingdom of heaven is within. He wasn't talking about within your body. Don't go looking for it inside your body. <laughs> Don't, none of you go for any heart surgeries. I think Jesus is in my heart. Okay, open heart surgery, take, me, take this body apart. Jesus is somewhere in this pump. Jesus is in this muscle that's going pump, 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 you know. No, that's not the heart. That's not the within. That's not the within Jesus was talking about. He was talking about the stillness, the silence. He was talking about still your mind. That's why meditation, prayer are so important. Go into the stillness within. God rest you'll find God in the stillness within. Okay, how is that practical? What about, uh, I always have lots of questions that come and say, well, yeah, that, that all sounds really good, David, but I've got some practicalities here that I would like to have addressed. Seema was writing in and she remembers uh, hosting, I think, Kirsten, myself, Ricky, Nikita visiting there in Rochester. I heard David talk about how he was eating just one meal a day. And then she 
here's me when I'm talking and I'm over in, into the Kingdom Retreat in the Netherlands and I'm talking about a, a liquid diet and she's saying, I would like to know how this whole quantum love thing relates to my diet. I want to know how quantum love relates to my diet. Well, from the perspective I'm sharing, it should be clear that the behaviors and the actions and the guidances that come have to come very involuntarily. It would be like, you know, some people talk about um, like intermittent fasting. I think I've, I've read on the internet that that's becoming a fad now. <laughs> Nutritionists are saying intermittent fasting will help you live longer. If you, if you eat less and you eat kind of closer together and then you you fast, you don't eat for longer periods of hours, you will live longer. Who wants to live longer in time and space, you know? We're here to enter the holy instant together. We're here to go into the quantum field. Practically speaking, as you go for this, blessed are the pure of heart, as you go for this purification of consciousness, as you go for this stilling the mind, as you go for this thy will be done, Holy Spirit, tell me what to say, what to do. I'll do anything. I'll, I'll be a storyteller for you. I will, I will write. I will be an alternative medical professional. I'll be a health professional. I'll do anything you want. Jesus is saying, just keep coming inside and laying aside those concepts that you believe you are. And as you empty your mind of all these concepts and become more and more still, Everything that occurs in the dream will just be a reflection of that mind. And so, as you start to have the mana from heaven, and you start to be aware of the, we'll use an Indian term, prana, the prana energies, you become more and more aware of the prana energy. These thoughts about what should I eat, or habits of eating, and so on and so forth, will be, obviously will fade from your awareness because eating is just an action in time and space. And as you focus more and more on, on your purpose, on the function of coming back inside the projector and getting closer and closer to the light, everything that's once seemed to have importance will start to just fade and fade and fade away, like, like flowers that have bloomed already and now they can just fade and go back to the earth. It'll be that way with all these thoughts and these concepts. But you'll be given every step of the way, you just be, become intuitive and more intuitive and even more intuitive and even more intuitive so that you aren't acting and reacting with an external world anymore. You're simply following the Beloved and going within. You're entering, entering into mysticism, you know. And India, of course, is so many mystics and saints, you know. Seema wrote in to, to Emily and I about that thing of, I think, six or seven years ago, uh, facilitating a Course in Miracles group, and a lot of the people in the group were going through their Jesus issues, but not Seema. Seema didn't really have a, a context for, for Jesus, What didn't have a lot of preconditioned notions about Jesus. Jesus was just another sweet beloved uh, among all the beloveds, you know, that's a beautiful perspective in the deep tradition of India to be raised with that where you could just welcome Jesus but you didn't have all these preconceptions about Jesus. Maybe not preconceptions about sacrifice and penance and fearful images of, of, of someone that, that many Christians are, are actually afraid of. <laughs> They're afraid of Jesus. They like Mother Mary, they like the angels, <laughs> but terrified of Jesus. But see, that just showed how when you come as a little child, when you come without preconceptions, curious about the light, then how quickly these, these false perceptions just fade away. They just fade away. So thank you, Seema. Thank you for sharing that. Um, also, Elanique, uh, Elanique, you were on our um, our, our Christmas uh, retreat, and on there we used the example of how your your son passed away. But actually, uh, what you carried on with in in this um, 
in this retreat is that you had some very practical questions because even though your son, one son passed away, you do have a, a seven years old son now, Nicholas, and, and you've been, ever since that Christmas retreat, you've been doing a lot of reading, prayer, contemplation since the last retreat. I've been struggling to reconcile the teachings with the real life applications of these. And then you mention a few different areas, three different areas. The first one is that your son Nicholas uh, is basically seven years old and since his brother has passed away, you know, you want so much as a mother to to guide him, to shower him with love, to nurture him. You sense that he he is missing his his brother who has passed away. And you say in here, however, I know the Course teaches that there are no special relationships. That exclusion of one thing means that the whole principle of wholeness is lost. Although I know that God created Nicholas's soul, then you get into questions of was it me who brought him into this dream? Did he will himself here through his own choice? And here's the question, how do we parent with love, devotion and care while still avoiding the specialness trap. I sense that the answer lies, not, lies in the mind and not in form, that we can assume our roles as parents in the world of form while still retaining awareness of this as a role and not as the truth. How, is this how we can still be functional parents to our children while still doing the work of transformation. So this is beautiful. Elanique is just saying, I want to forgive, I want to practice the Course, my one son passed away, I have another son here, and, and I want to really shower him with love. And this is what I would call guided parenting, because I would say the son Nicholas is part of the the backdrop for you coming into the quantum field. In other words, should you sh shower Nicholas with love and care? Yes. Should you treat Nicholas as an equal among all the brothers and sisters of the world? Let's just say there's, there's six and a half or seven billion people on the planet and there's Nicholas right in front of you, right close to the projector, which is projecting Elanique, the mom, and also Nicholas, the child. The thing you don't want to get into is protectionism. When you see Nicholas exclusively as a body, then you will find these protectionism things becoming activated. I must protect my son Nicholas from things in the world. If Nicholas is raised up as important, more important than my neighbor's children or other children of the world or other people of the world, that will bring fear and protectionism in and will actually limit your experience of forgiveness because you will be taking one aspect and raising that one aspect up above the other aspects. And that's where the protectionism comes in. Some people call it the maternal instinct. You want to have the Christ instinct in you, the Christ presence in you, include the rest of the world in with Nicholas and not exclude the rest of the world outside of Nicholas. Specialness excludes. Wholeness, forgiveness includes. So. It's the same with all of our relationships. As soon as we, in this ego world, and this ego mindset, wrong-mindedness of selective perception, as long as we play the game of selective perception, we're playing the game of ego preferences. And if you prefer to believe that you can love your child Nicholas more than you can love other children, more than you can love other people, then that selective perception, that preference, even if it seems to be right in front of you, the preference for that will keep you from knowing the quantum field. It will keep you from experiencing yourself as the Christ. 
So when we look at relationships in this world, when I look at things like, it's January now, but coming up February 14th, you know, in the United States, at least in many cultures, is, is Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day is often a time for buying roses and candy and gifts for who? For that one special one that's in your life. Whether it's a partner, a husband, a wife, a soulmate, whatever you want. And when you focus the love on one to the exclusion of the rest, of the rest of those seven billion, you are falling right into the ego's trap of specialness. The ego invented this world of time and space and it invented special relationships to take the place of the Christ identity. Agape, universal love, the love of Christ, the Christ love looks upon the whole world from that love. You could say Jesus in waking up and coming to this state of mind, and, and actually that's what religion is, it's a state of mind, it's not a theology. True philosophy is a state of mind. Quantum physics and the quantum field, it's a state of mind. True poetry is a state of mind. Everything glorious. The kingdom of heaven is not a place. You will not go to a place. It's a state of mind. And so for Valentine's Day, the Saint Valentine started that, but please let's not do the same distortions like with Christmas. Christmas comes along, what did you do? Buy a bunch of material gifts for the special loved ones. Oh my God! <laughs> Talk about giving your mind over to the ego on Christmas, on the Christ Mass, on, the, on a, just the day to remind you that you're the Christ and that everyone's the Christ and that Christ, the sight of Christ is all there is to see. The song of Christ is all there is to hear. The hand of Christ is the only hand to hold. There is no journey but to make with Christ because Christ is who we are. The ego turns it into gifts. Did you get me a gift? Well, is that all you? You didn't get me a gift this year? Well, hell, I'm not going to get you a gift next year then. If I'm giving you a gift and you're not giving... Oh my God! <laughs> oh my gosh! Talking about missing the presence of the season and it's all turned into materialism and gift giving. Easter. I remember I felt this huge sense Easter is like, oh my God, it's the symbol of the resurrection. He is risen. We are all risen. We're all innocent. We're all free. That's what Easter to me is. It's the symbol of this Easter egg hunts. Candy. What? A bunny, a rabbit, <laughs> oh my God, what, what did the ego invent to take the place of Christmas? What did the ego invent to take the place of Easter? What about Valentine's Day? Oh my gosh, the ego came up with a substitute for romantic love to take the place of agape, universal, unconditional Christ love. What a trickster! This whole Newtonian thing has got to go. I can't continue to see the world through Newtonian filters when I'm missing out on, the, on all the love that comes from my Creator. Why would I hold on to these tiny little substitutes and this linear perspective when the vastness of all creation is, is available? So. I hope that helps you. Now, Elenique did say that she would not be able to attend uh, Friday night, and maybe she's, I haven't seen her on screen, so she'll catch the replay. It's like the Truman Show. I'll catch David on the replay there. <laughs> it'll, it'll all come out. This will reach Elenique for sure. She also uh, was wondering about, um, about how perception works and how the power of perception shapes our reality. Actually, um, perception is just shaped by the, the beliefs that we hold in our consciousness. So the power of our mind, if we made the ego, we can certainly unmake the ego. If we believed in the ego, we could certainly withdraw our belief from it. And that's what the power of the mind is used for. 
That's how we actually let the Holy Spirit and Jesus reshape our perception to show us the happy dream or the real world to, to take us to the quantum field. And then also, it was at the end, her last question was on good works. The Course teaches that the world is a dream and a, an illusion. Nothing in form is real. Therefore, suffering, pollution, abuse, hunger, and the like are not really happening. Our best way of helping is to awaken ourselves that we may be a source of light and truth. Uh, does, yet does that mean that we should not help those around us that are physically struggling? Well, that's another great question too from Elanique. In other words, when your mind becomes purified and you become right-minded, when you start to realize that you're just watching a dream, and you're aware that you're watching a dream, then whatever will move through you, in other words, any actions the body will take, any words that the body will speak, anything that will come from and through you, even using the body as a, as a teaching device, will be coming from a motive of innocence, from a motive of joy from a motive of happiness. You see that's a, a big question is, what is it for? What, what is my action coming from? Am I coming from this place of, of peace? Like in the Messiah series I was talking about, about Netflix, if it's coming from a place of stillness and peace, the words, the actions will be inspired by that peace and by that tranquility you will be a beacon of light because you are linked up with the source of all. You are linked up with the light of, of God, the light of Christ. And so you could say that it's entirely involuntary too. It's not like you, you have to go and find this place of peace and then you say, from this place of peace and tranquility, what should I do? Because the doing is completely involuntary. Miracles are involuntary. You won't even have to ask the question, you know, you know, does the flower ask, why am I a flower? Does the tree ask, why am I a, tr a tree? Does the wind have to ask the Holy Spirit, should I blow? <laughs> you, you, you don't have, it. when you come to a place of harmony, that's it. You are a beholder of love and light, and everything that the body seems to do will be under the involuntary control of spirit. So, you, Jesus is not trying to plan a future, uh, what do I do next, what do I do now, what do I do next? When you become a conduit, when you become merged with that light, the question ceases to enter your mind. You're no longer saying, should I do or not to do? You know, even Shakespeare, I mentioned Shakespeare earlier. Shakespeare didn't, is not known for saying, to do or not to do, that is the question. <laughs> Shakespeare said, to be or not to be, that is the question. To be one with the quantum field or not to be one with the quantum field, that is the question. To be Newtonian or to be quantum? That is the question. Shakespeare's having a good time. I'm, I'm reformulating his famous, most famous lines. <laughs> to be Newtonian or not to be? And to be quantum? That is the question. So, so it's all coming down to what is your perspective? And your perspective comes down from your motivation. Like Andy was talking about, he was saying you, we need to learn to give and not to get. And Sylvia, that was beautiful. Thank you for being so transparent. That was just gorgeous. You, you were doing that for the whole universe. You were being so transparent about this whole thing about getting. Of course it's frustrating to experience those emotions. Of course it's frustrating to have those thoughts. Those aren't your real thoughts, by the way. I know who you really are and, and who you are is so beautiful, so sparkling and beautiful, but your transparency was, was a great example and a witness for everybody that you were able to join, you were able to, so to speak, spill the beans, not hide it, not protect it, 
And then everybody felt lighter just through what you did. That's forgiveness. You were going right into the field. You turned right towards the field. And that's where the innocence is found. I think also today I was reading amazing things. Jennifer Norton, I haven't seen you for, for some time in North Carolina, but, but you were saying, for me, it's about fully living from my heart and coming from unconditional love. I'd like help with overcoming the barriers to living this way. Actually, I am aware of a sense of fear coming from some part of me about fully committing to this, and I'd like help with that. Well, you've come to the right place. There you are, Jennifer. Nice to see you again. Because we're here to support each other in this commitment for mind training. That's really what the Course is about. It's about mind training. It's about getting so clear of our purpose, getting so clear about our motivations, getting so trusting in being sourced, in being aligned with guidance and the guidance of Jesus and the guidance of the Holy Spirit, that things around us that seem to be part of our dream, including the body, all seem to be part of a happy play where things are just taken care of. You know, like when we used to read the fairy tales, when we're reading Cinderella, when we're reading uh, one of those amazing fairy tales, we're not usually caught up into all the logistics about where do you get your, your sustenance, how does this happen, what do you do for a living, you know, all those, what's your education? Cinderella, do you have a, do you have a bachelor's degree? A, a master's degree? You know, we're not interested. We, the reason we like fairy tales is because the scenes kind of flow together and we're really interested in the lesson. Like, what is this fairy tale speaking to me about? What is the lesson I need to learn from this story of Cinderella? You know, from the story of Rumpelstiltskin or from all the, all the parables and the, the fairy tales, we're wanting to know what the lesson is. And the lesson is that we're the dreamer of this dream. And the only way we can even move towards the experience of being the dreamer, you know, like uh, John Lennon talked about, you know, the, the dreamer in, in Imagine, the only way we come close to that dreamer experience is we have to have these miraculous experiences where things are all taken care of and we feel the smoothness and the lightness of that dream and yet we attribute everything back to the guidance. We attribute it back to spirit. With everything that seems to go on, we have a lot of gratitude. Thank you, spirit. Thank you, spirit. And I mean for everything. If, if our house is washed away in a, in a flood or burned down in a fire, thank you. There, this has to be for my spiritual awakening. This has to be for me releasing attachments. This has to be for me releasing condemnation and judgment. This has to be the lesson. It may even seem as if things are being taken away from us in the dream, but it's only because we believe we possess them in the first place that the problem came in. We believed in ownership. We believed we could possess. Love does not possess. We believe we could possess partners, houses, children, we believe we could possess bank accounts and investment accounts. We believe we could possess countries or even states in countries. Maybe we identified with Ohio or North Carolina at one point. But <laughs> the Spirit's like, well, it goes much deeper than this. You know, I'm going to show you that you live and move and breathe in Spirit. You always have been Spirit. But we need to be convinced of this, so that's where the trust has to grow. And it has to grow and grow and grow and grow. I mean, it has to grow a lot for us to, to reach that. So I thank you, Jennifer, for joining in with us, because uh, you say I would like to go deeper into trusting Spirit to guide me and take care of me. I really think that for me, 30 years ago when I was 30 some years ago when I picked up the course, I could feel this swirl of like, I'm going to have to trust like I've never trusted before. I remember about 
you know, 30 some years ago when I was questioning the idea of a career, it's worked out really well for me not having a career. Uh, when I was wondering, will I ever have a house? It's worked out real well for me not having to own or possess a house. I worked, how has it worked out living in divine providence where I just trusted guidance to be, to provide for me? I trusted the guidance within and not the learning of the world. I was in university for 10 years, undergrad and grad, and I picked up a lot of learning that was supposed to help me navigate time and space, I thought. But it was actually the guidance, the intuitive guidance, that guided me to North Carolina, that had me in Chapel Hill, that had me in the Triangle area, that had me going around to different churches, different houses, meeting people. It was the guidance that guided me to these 44 countries. Just a backdrop and a mechanism for me to accept myself as the Christ. Nothing special about traveling, nothing special about any of the bodies, nothing special about any of the places, except to allow the guidance to loosen my mind from my identification with the bodies and with time and place. That's made all the difference. That's what's taken me into the quantum field. That's why I got excited about, <laughs> about the quantum field and, and quantum physics, because I saw that that that's the science that transcends the Newtonian. Uh, Seema is, is, was on here recently and she's been, she was a medical doctor, she was an MD, and the more she's gotten into the teachings, the guidance, the following, she just wrote a beautiful book for some of you, she's just, it's, it's just been published, and you just have to look up Seema, and you, you will find her book now getting distributed into the world. But the book is about following the inner guidance and using the symbols of the medical model, which is very much based on cause and effect in time and space. You know, when you look at those medical histories that doctors are supposed to look at, that's the past learning. When you looked at, at, at DNA and, and things that seem to get passed along from generation to generation, including things like birth defects and things like this. No, that's all false. It's all false because it's all based on a decision to hold on to the Newtonian. And the whole medical model is based on Newtonian physics. That's why you have to discover the body, the systems of the body, the organs of the body, how they all work together. That's Newtonian right there. The medical model is a prime example of Newtonian physics. As well as if we look at economics, you know, stocks and bonds and predictions and derivatives. And if you go into any realm of this world that you can study in university, I don't want to just pick on the medical field. It's everything. It's, it's everything. You know, it's a it's funny thing to me sometimes is it's in religion too, where a lot of religions are very much interested in your your lineage, your genetic history going back, who were your father and who was born by who, like the Bible, who begat who, who begat, 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 begat. All of that is nothing to do with the living Christ. Even Jesus, you know, in, in, in Christianity there's this big thing about which denomination you are and, and that they said Jesus was born in the lineage of David. Wait a minute, that's just history. David was just the king back in the Jewish history, but, but the Christ is reborn in this moment. The Christ is not Newtonian. The Christ is the ever-present love and joy of this moment. The Christ reaches us in and through eternity. That's why the presence of Jesus is most fully here and now, but it doesn't have anything to do with traditions. In the end, we have to let go of the medical model and choose the miracle. In the end, we have to let go of traditions and theologies and rituals. And you, know, you mentioned this morning in your email too, uh, Seema, about these charms and amulets and, and these different things. You know, we don't need to go to the direction of reinforcing the repetition of the mistake. We're going into the correction which is the desire of your heart. You don't have to go back and learn the theologies of, of Jesus. You're happily free from them. 
And, and you, I can see it in your face. You're shining that light of Christ, you know. You're discovering Christ as yourself. This is so beautiful. So take a look everybody. That was a former medical doctor and who's now embracing the spiritual realms and, and being lifted up in the, the spirituality. Okay, I've got about 20 minutes left and I, I really, oh my God. Susan Jameson, I'm just so touched. I feel your heart. You want to join. You want to, to be used. Yes, 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 and more yes. But the one I really want to use at the very end here, after I take a sip of tea, this is for all of us, is Kristen, Kristen Lorraine out there from Stanford because, yeah, this is, this is powerful. I woke up this morning and then um, I happened to read through this and oh my gosh, my heart just was so touched and I just thought, wow, Kristen is doing it for the whole universe here. This is, is amazing. And I was so uh, honored actually to uh, read what you had written because I think this has everything to do with quantum love and, and to me I'm always into the practical application. If it's not practical, if it, it's not, if I can't experience it, then I, I don't, I'm not interested in it. I need an experience of this quantum love. So I'm, I'm going to share a little bit of what Kristen wrote. Dear David and Living Miracles community, I would love to share what's coming up in my mind and heart to pour it forth for healing. It feels timed orchestrated for this weekend's theme. Yes, indeed. Jonah and I watched Powder last night, and I have to say I did tune in last night, so I got to yeah, experience what you shared uh, last night. It was just amazing about the Christ energy and really being drawn into the Christ energy. Not so much uh, Jesus the man, but the Christ. Jonah and I watched Powder last night, and during the final scene of lightning and transcendence, a voice in my mind played over and over. The voice was, I don't like this movie. I don't like this movie. I could feel my mind wanting to attack it to keep from feeling a rising grief and isolation. From the first scene where Powder is hiding in the darkness of his basement home, I felt I am him, or I was until I found the Course 16 months ago. I have been hiding all my life, with the last 10 years quite literally, often curled up in the darkness in the fetal position in tears in this tiny cottage, shutting down my work and movement in the world. After five years in shaking terror and panic, uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome aftermath of my experiences of abuse with a spiritual teacher, and then five years with an undiagnosed rare condition on a nerve that caused acute pain and sleep deprivation, immobility, and despair beyond what I could continue to endure. In early 2018, I decided that 2018 was my last year. I had already begun paperwork for assisted death in Switzerland when the Course entered my life that June, and I began it devotedly that September. I just finished the lessons for the first time Christmas Day. I remember praying in early 2018 that if love is real and safety is possible to feel, and God is really benevolence, I want to feel this, to know the truth of Him before I leave. I had decided it would take a miracle to stay, and the past 18 or past 16 months have been that miracle over and over. Everything is changed and changing. When Powder chose ascension at the end of the film, running toward the lightning, toward God and communion, I knew I was supposed to feel a rightness to it, and a transcendence uplifted. Instead, I looked at all the rapt faces on the screen who felt something I didn't understand and felt my own distance, even anger. 
I felt Powder's longing still for worldly home, his longing to go back into the basement of his house, that cave of safety, books, and hiding. I could only feel his choice to leave the world as a choice for suicide, which was my own near choice. And perhaps my lifelong belief that there is no other choice, because there is no place in this world for him or me. The Holy Spirit today gave me a picture of myself as having moved through the world wearing an enormous tan overcoat, a very large pulled over my head that people don't even know whether there is a person inside of it. This is what is up for healing, thanks to powder. This hiding and belief in the need to hide is the ego's creation of a world, isn't it? The body and the world, a place to hide from God. Last night I dreamt of being in the Living Miracles community somewhere with two people there, a woman and a man. I don't now remember who they were, and the three of us were carrying one another around in a pool, laughing and joined, light and loving. This is the demonstration of a world I want to feel, in which all of you so generously share each month with these retreats and in every way you do on social media. A stable consistency of love, of seeing love, of feeling love rather than attack, of sharing and blessing, of being in the open, free rather than hiding. When I joined with Katerina this morning, my MMT partner, I could feel the spirit with us, as I always do with her, and that the love I have always felt an absence of, always felt a profound wailing to feel, the, the love and safety is already all around me, all the time, and that I'm just afraid to even call it love, as if naming it, looking at it, seeing it, would truly let me let it into my awareness, which I fear. And so I look and ask, ask at it or turn away, look away. I don't want to look away. Oh, then you put a beautiful uh, <clears throat> prayer. It's, it's from the Foreigner song. I know it very well. <laughs> I want to know what love is. I want you to show me. I want to feel what love is. I know you can show me. This is my prayer. I don't want to feel like a foreigner anymore. Oh, nice play on words there. I want to know and feel what love is, beyond all doubt. I want to remove all obstacles to my awareness of love's presence. I want to make an open space of welcome in my mind for the love and Christ to clear out all the clutter I have laid there, sweep out the dust, open all the windows to the light, lay down soft carpets, and sit together with my brothers and with Christ, knowing we sit with our Father together. Thank you for everything with love and gratitude, Kristen. So there's a lot of aspects so, so, Kristen, you've just laid bare your soul to all of us. It's very, very touching. From what I have shared today, you know, this is the, the journey we, ta we take now, is that we are joined in this prayer at going deep inside our mind and, and allowing anything that is still lingering there to be lifted up to the light. That's all the world is for now. So before we had sought for many things, and many of us are joined together in knowing that we have sought for uh, comfort and safety, like, like, uh, like Powder did. You know, Powder, he seemed to be an alien, not of this world with all kinds of supernatural intuitions and abilities, psychokinesis, he could move objects with the power of his mind and he could tap into things. And he also tapped into like an innocence. But in this world, innocence needs to be protected. 
in heaven, innocence is the way it is. It's simply the state of being that is. So, so we must allow the concepts and beliefs in our mind that tell us that we are here in this world to be turned over to the light. So we take a very extraordinary journey now together and what you've done is for all of us, you've kind of laid it bare and say, you know, I got to the point where I didn't want, I couldn't endure the, the pain and the suffering. It became too intense and so I began to look for assisted suicide as, as an escape. All of us have gone through these thoughts and these ideas and we're, we're just assured from the Spirit, no, uh, we never escape from a death wish through death. We escape from a death wish through healing, through resurrection, through salvation, through non-judgment, through joy, through happiness. It makes sense that we would move towards eternal joy and happiness by having a happy dream. And therefore we are entering into that happy dream together. I recently saw a video of, of Judy Scutch, Judy Whitson, Scutch Whitson, who um, was basically talking about that her whole focus now is on the happy dream. That every thought that she has that comes up in her mind of sickness, she hands it over so that she may enter the happy dream. Every thought she has with the struggle in a relationship, she hands it over that she may enter a happy dream. Uh, her husband of many years, Whit, uh, I call him William Whitson, a dear friend of mine, he passed away and then um, that was even the thought she had to look at because it was, you know, the thought with you have an elderly couple like, okay, who's going to go first and don't you, don't you leave me this way. I won't survive. You know, the thought of a, of a partner leaving us after all those years, Judy had to face that one, with passed away. And so we are joined in the, the purification of, the, of consciousness to reach a state of awareness where we do not hold on to a scrap of judgment a scrap of concern, a scrap of doubt. That scene you had of being in a Living Mary's Miracles uh, community with a man and a woman and the three of you taking each other around in a pool, that, that's a beautiful scene. I shared that with the studio crew here, here when I walked in today because I, we happen to be blessed with pools and, and in the summertime in particular, <laughs> That, that is not such a far-fetched scene at all. In fact, I do remember one time I was in California. I was in Northern California where you live and I met this woman and, and we both started to dive like little children into our minds, into this place of, of joy and happiness and innocence. And it was so quantum, so expansive. And uh, we ended up uh, taking a trip I think with one other person, we said, let's take a trip to um, Las Vegas. And we just met each other. We took a trip to Las Vegas. And I remember we were in a, in a, a hotel that had this beautiful swimming pool. And I remember going down and, and her name was Christina. Yours is Kristen. Her name was Christina. And I, and we, I went down and the pool was very warm. And she just said, would you just float me around in the pool, David? I think somehow that will be very helpful in my life. And so I just floated her around, she laying on her back on this warm pool in Las Vegas with all the lights and everything, you know, typical Las Vegas. And there I was floating her in the pool with the lights in the pool and everything. And what a mystical that experience that, that was. And I've actually... When you mentioned that scene, I thought, wow, I've, I've actually seen, witnessed that scene several times in my life of, of either floating, being floated. You mentioned a man and a woman. I was, I was down in Colombia one time and we went to the ocean of what seemed to be Valentine's Day and we all were putting mud on each other and floating each other in the warm uh, Pacific Ocean. Um, 
So that, that very scene that you imagined is kind of a symbol to you is actually a scene that I've witnessed a number of times where there's this, this sense of being held, there's a sense of playfulness, there's a sense of lightness, there's not the sense of, of the world. We weren't seeing each other as men or women or bodies. It was like this light sense of floating and playfulness that children sometimes have where they're just playing together and they lose track of time and space in the love and the light. So we are so joined because, because this is a journey of not trying to make the world a better place. We are not really concerned about trying to change the world. Our devotion and prayers and energy, as Jesus says, he says, seek not to change the world, seek rather to change your mind about the world. We are focused on the purpose. That's why Emily and Andy talk so much about the giving, the extending. They were describing even their own phone calls and tuning into relaxing and just coming so into a joyful place of relaxation that we can behold the world with calm eyes. We can behold the world in gentleness and lightness. It's like every day is a happy spring day, flowers blooming. Regardless of what the images are showing, we, we come to a state of mind that brings that love through us by beholding the world that we're just dreaming it. And so we're not looking at accentuating part of the world. We're not trying to build or grow a community. We're not trying to, to necessarily find a betterment for society because we know that the, the forgiveness in our hearts, as we be, become still, as we become joyful, that brings the blessing to the world. That's what the world is calling for. It's calling for that joyful sense of inclusion, happiness, love. It's not calling for a seeming change in material conditions or change in outcomes and consequences as the world would judge it. You know, sometimes they talk about uh, like all of the things that have occurred throughout history. There's been, through history on Earth, just ice ages and we've had ages of, of huge continental drifts and dinosaurs and pterodactyls, and we've had all these kind of things, and, and it reminds me a bit of this movie Lucy with Scarlett Johansson, where toward the end of her journey, as she is zooming towards the quantum field at light speed, she's in a chair, and she has these scenes that are of the history of the Earth that come, and she sits there and she watches, and there's dinosaurs in one scene, and she's seeing all the scenes of time and space on Earth. And she's gently taking her hand like this and whooshing by into another era. And then she transcends another era. And then she transcends another era. And then ultimately she goes beyond the form. And the only thing that's left uh, is the message, I am everywhere. You know, very much like the Transcendence movie with Johnny Depp. Uh, I am everywhere. Spirit is, is everywhere. Spirit is not contained by images of time and space. How vast a lesson that is. Instead of trying to manipulate the images, instead of trying to survive on planet Earth, we're transcending linear time through the holy instant. And Jesus tells us at the end of 2019, as he tells us at the end of, of any year, for the upcoming year, make this year different by making it all the same. See it with me, he's saying. See it with me. See it from this transcendent state of mind. Now, this afternoon, there's going to be a movie, and this is, this is a mind-opener movie. So if, 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 this was the, if I delivered the message in the textbook, this afternoon is the lab. If you, thought, if you thought you had some emotions coming up with powder, hold on to your hat, because this afternoon it's, we're going to show a movie that's just nothing more than a mind-opener. This will, this will pop your ideas of 
relationships. Yes, I know over the years Jesus has just popped all my perceptions of relationships and expanded them. And just when I think they can't get can't get any more expansive, he's like, well, come and see from the field. If you want to really see relationship as it truly is, if you want to see holy relationship, come into the field with me and I'll show you holy relationship. But don't hold on to any concepts of exclusion. Don't hold on to all your old ideas and past learning of relationships because you can't be born again. You can't be born anew in the quantum field with me and no quantum love if you have any scraps of ideas or concepts of relationships. You want to be in total communication with everyone and anything? Come into the field. You want to come into a place where everything is unified and connected, where there's only the reflection of God's love? Come into the field. But you must not hide and protect any concepts that you have of anything. Seem is doing that with the medical field. Seem is doing that with her perception of her mother, her father, her son. We're all doing that here in community. Every day, oh my gosh, we are being lifted up and lifted up and lifted up higher and higher and higher toward this quantum field because that's the only way where the joy is constant. You want a facsimile of love, then there's romantic love, there's love of interpersonal relationships and, and so on and so forth. Uh, you tried it, I tried it too, we've tried it, and ultimately we know that love has to be constant. And that if we haven't experienced love in a constant way, then we haven't experienced love at all. That's the humble way to go towards the field. If you haven't experienced love constantly, then you haven't experienced it at all, because love is constant. God is constant. Christ is constant. Newtonian, temporary. Christ, constant. The world, temporary. Christ, constant. Beliefs about God, temporary. God, constant. Love is constant. So we're going for constancy. We're going for constancy. That's the trademark of divinity. It's constant. That's what eternity means. It's, it's forever. Forever is a constant. Sometimes people say, the only thing constant in this world is change. No. No. Change is not constant. <laughs> Newtonian, change. <laughs> Love, constant. That's how you know. You know how you feel. Your feelings are your barometer. As you wake up and open yourself to the field, it will be your feelings that will confirm to you the love. It will reveal. That will be the revelation. So I thank you all. I'm happy for everything that you wrote in. And um, I think if you want to enjoy a, a meal or take a walk or if you really want to get yourself jazzed up for uh, the movie and you want to really come into that movie soaring, I think Eric maybe has already put a link, uh, hopefully, to uh, Quantum Love. Put it on repeat. Uh, put the song Quantum Love on repeat during your break and then show up for the movie with just a, an anticipation of being taken into the field. Because this is a very, very good tool. I, I have used this tool uh, a number of times. Some of you have seen it. You really haven't seen it till you go into the field. And if some of you have not seen it, ooh, you lick your chops <laughs> for this one and <laughs> enjoy it. So thank you. I, I love seeing your faces. I love being with you. I love feeling your hearts and, and your transparency and your willingness to really go for it. 
to open up. There's Kirsten, the the author, the channel, I should say, of 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 quantum love. There's the one, and she pulled over and had to turn, pull the car to the side of the road, and and actually take these lyrics down because uh, this one came from Jesus. This is a Jesus love song for the whole universe. And if you want to prepare for the movie uh, this afternoon, I say put it on repeat and and uh, let your mind soar in quantum love. And then watch the movie with just willingness. Just let Jesus take your hand and, and uh, away we go. So thank you. Thank you all.